So welcome, I'm here with Marc Walder, he's the CEO of Ringier, a Swiss-based media company that is operated globally. Um, thank you, Marc, for your time. Um, I spent some time looking at your CV and um, I noticed two things. Firstly, you used to be a professional tennis player for eight years and secondly, you've been with Ringier for almost 30 years. How do you do the transition from a tennis player to becoming a media mm -hmm. manager? And what motivates you to spend 30 years in a single company? Mm -hmm. um, okay, um, f first of all, obviously I was not successful enough as a tennis player, so I still have to work today. That's the first point. Second point is, um, how did I get to Ringier? How did I get into media? It was a coincidence, like often. At that time, uh, just to, to, to you know, show a little anecdote, at that time, uh, when I stopped my career at 27, 28, as a tennis professional, um, I didn't know what to do. And uh, I knew that I was quite, you know, I had a good network in, in, in tennis, obviously, because that was my colleagues and my opponents. And uh, I always liked media, kind of, so I said, why don't I apply to become a journalist in, uh, in, in the sports sector, mm -hmm. or even better, in the tennis sector. So that's, that's how it happened. I, I started with a thousand Swiss francs in salary, uh, was a very young journalist, and they sent me to small tournaments. And, and then I did my kind of career, which was always, you know, luck and coincidence and opportunity driven. So there was no big plan. Why did I spend um, basically my whole professional life at Ringier? Um, first of all, this is a, 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 a truly good company, very innovative, great shareholders, future-oriented, um, speed, um, and that gave me many opportunities you know, to just change my work during the past 25 years. So I have been a journalist, I run big newspapers and big magazines, mm -hmm. then I became more, more a commercial guy, uh, responsible on the sales side, then I took over our Swiss operations and then finally the whole group. Um, so that's the story. Mm -hmm. What differentiates Ringier from other media companies? Um, First of all, by heart, we, um, we are a publisher, mm -hmm. or we started our transformation as a publisher. I would say today we are still a publisher, but we are also a diversified and highly digitized media company. So a publisher because we had 140 magazines and newspapers when I started the transformation together with my team and, and the shareholders who had to pay a lot of money for the transformation. We'll come to that in a second. So 140 newspapers and magazines and obviously, it, basically in this room where we sit today, uh, that kind of kickoff meeting took place with the shareholders where we said, well, if, you, if we continue this business, just being a publisher with newspapers and magazines and printing plants, mm -hmm. then there is probably no big future because things go digital. And things go digital means um, we are being disrupted. It's a huge tsunami. So we earn less money with newspapers, we earn less money with, uh, new, with uh, magazines. So we had to invest into new business models, mm -hmm. of course, digital business, mo business models. And there, mainly, we decided to go for marketplaces. Mm -hmm. Marketplaces in jobs, in real estate, and in car verticals. This is what we have done. Spend um, almost two billion Swiss francs uh, for this transformation, so we were heavily into M&A, buying big and smaller um, verticals um, and uh, our EBTA completely changed. So we did 100% offline 10 years ago. Today, 70% of our uh, EBTA, we make about 115 million EBTA roughly. 70% um, is, is digital today. So really turned the company within 10 years once once you know around mm -hmm. we have two core kind of businesses one is still publishing and within publishing you have to um, kind of make the difference between offline that has you know strict rules in terms of becoming more efficient um, because you have less money mm -hmm. it 
turnover is, 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 in, is decreasing. And then you have the online publishing where you need to have new skills. Um, in publishing today, and also in marketplaces today, um, good content is only as good as tech and data skills mm -hmm. underlying the good content is worth. So, again, publishing and marketplaces are our two core businesses. Mm -hmm. And we actually had, a week ago, we had a huge kind of kickoff event where we said, and this might surprise you, we have to become a tech-driven company. This is like a huge cultural change. You know, we have always been a, a, a journalistic-driven company, a content-driven company, and um, we still are that, but priority now is we have to be state-of-the-art in tech and, uh, and, and data. So that was the kickoff, and we are pushing this as a, you know, prior one um, theme into the company. Mm -hmm. Besides investing in, in new startups or initiatives and spinning off your own businesses, how do you foster innovation within Ringier? We did transform really, I would say, almost in a, in a dramatic way, really fast, um, paid a lot of money and changed the culture and realized today well, it's never finished. It's even accelerating. Now, how do we try to do that? We bring in new know-how through companies we acquired, mm -hmm. try to learn from those companies we acquired, bring know-how into, um, into, in, in, into the company. But secondly, with the existing workforce, we have about 7,000 employees. Um, we try to push them day by day to be part of this learning curve to um, you know keep keep kind of mentioning that we are in a lifelong learning um, uh, environment plus of course desperately fighting to get the right talents mm -hmm. in terms of software engineers data analytics um, you know kind of the whole um, underlying basis of a company like like us and this is probably the toughest challenge because I understand but you know better than me I understand there's roughly 600,000 IT jobs that um, are def desperately looking for the right talent in Europe only um, about as many in the US as well so we are desperately looking for the right people, for the right talent in a so fast changing world. I think that's the biggest challenge we are all facing. You founded an initiative called Digital Switzerland. Could you tell us a little bit about that? So we started with a small group of, I would say, seven, eight, nine uh, big corporate companies. Today we are 130 members. All the big companies in Switzerland are member of Digital Switzerland. What do we do to cut it down really, you know, shortly? We take care of the startup um, ecosystem, try to help them. Uh, we try to, you know, improve regulatory framework. Mm -hmm. We try to um, help the uh, corporates to change, to find their way. Um, we try to bring um, uh, bring it to the society because at the end of the day moms and dads and grandfathers and grandmothers and kids and boys and girls they all have to deal with digitization they all have to deal with transformation so we are creating uh, the digital day for the second time October 25th in Switzerland so Digital Switzerland is quite a unique initiative in Europe uh, we then launched Digital Poland as well because we are strongly invested in Poland plus Serbia so we have now Digital Switzerland, Digital Poland and Digital Serbia and by the way we also have Digital Liechtenstein. So um, Europe has to move you know we have the US very dominant we have China probably even more dominant and Europe in the middle and we have to focus uh, on what we are good at. Education Academia, science, very good. Engineers in, in a 
don't misunderstand me in a, in a kind of, I, I say the old fashioned way, but I don't mean it this way. We're good. Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurship, good, maybe even very good. You know, ethical skills uh, and, and attitudes, I think, very strong. We lack, um, first of all, scale. Um, so that's a handicap. Um, we lack a kind of an entrepreneurship thinking. I think regulatory framework needs to be adjusted. Um, um, we maybe lack a bit of the mentality um, of just do it. You know, we have a lot of yes butters in Europe. What do you think are the methods in order to move things forward in a faster way, rather than just waiting for <clears throat> certain decision makers to be replaced? What I see is um, actually one of the key elements is indeed what you say that boards, of, you know, top executives who run companies, who run uh, corporate structures, actually tend to optimize the current business. The board, the top executives, people who run the company, make the, the decision makers, those who allocate money, um, should actually leave the existing, let's call it legacy business, and just work on the future. The workforce that is taking care of the legacy business is doing a fine job. You know, they're optimizing the existing business, they're becoming more efficient, they're becoming smarter in what they do, and top executives should actually just ask themselves, where does this company, you know, need to be in five years, in seven years, maybe even in two years, and then act that way, invest that way, shift workforce that way, um, create new business models, new products, that would then match in two, four, six, seven years uh, the needs of your customers. And uh, executives tend to just focus on um, optimizing the here and now, because that's already a tough job. And then, you know, who takes care of the future? So that's kind of maybe just leave existing business for half a year, only focus on your industry, on your company, where, you, where, where it should be in the future. And then I think that would help you to get a more prioritized um, um, to-do list, what you really want to focus on. Where do you see Switzerland heading in the next 10 years? What are the topic areas where Switzerland will be a world leader? So let's start with the kids. If you are seven, eight, nine years old, there's not much big of a change between what I have learned at that time, again, 34. 40 years ago, first point, we need to improve skills like computational thinking in primary schools, even in kindergarten. Secondly, academia, and we have with ETH and uh, EPFL, two of the globally leading tech universities, um, they need to make sure like any other company as an institution, that they stay ahead of the curve. Many reasons. Also, funding is important. They need to get the funding that is needed to stay ahead of the curve. If they don't do a good job, then we are in big trouble because talent, ideas, spin-off, they're coming mainly out of these two tech universities. Now, in Switzerland, there's not so much room because at the end of the day, you know, we, we act within the EU regulatory framework, but there is there's sometimes opportunities, like how do you tax startups? Like how easy is it to open a startup? Or sometimes even more important, how easy is it to close a startup if you don't do well? This is still quite, I think there's this room to improve. So that's the startup. Next point is funding. Uh, this is a rich country with rich companies, with rich investors, with uh, rich indi in, you know, individual people who have family offices. Now, where do they invest their money? Um, I think it's more sexy to invest in the Silicon Valley than to invest in Zurich into a startup. Um, and so we need to make sure that a part of this money is shifted again into our you know, startup ecosystem. So that's the fourth point. Fifth point, this all is not going to help if the big corporates 
are not, you know, bringing themselves into the future. So we need to make sure that uh, those companies are skilled enough, courageous enough, funded enough to um, kind of, you know, play an important role also in the future. So I would say, and then we have the, the government. And what is great um, for the past 12 months is government has kind of reached out to Digital Switzerland. So there is a bridge between, you know, what we do and our program and what they think is, is to be prioritized. My goal would rather be start smaller country by country. There's a lot of countries who do good things, great things. Estonia, just to quote one of them, uh, wonderful story what they did, what we do here in Switzerland is great. I think what uh, Macron is trying to do with, uh, with France is very interesting. Now we have a digital uh, minister of digitization in Germany, very interesting. Probably it's easier if country by country is really accelerating, pushing, investing, coordinating, probably brings us further than if we have to coordinate everything, you know, um, with an umbrella. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's about Europe. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Push at the end of the day needs to be private. Mm -hmm. Again, we started with nine. We are 130 now um, because we, you know, we member companies. Yeah, yes. because we 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 achieved such a fast growth and become so relevant. Government then policymakers reach out to us and say, "Hey, can we bridge your needs, your know-how, your priorities, your projects with us?" So this works well, even very well now. Um, if it comes top, I would call this bottom up. If this comes top down then I think um, you don't have the buy-in. It's like in a company. So it needs to be bottom-up, needs to get power, needs to get um, a grip on the street, mm -hmm. and then the policymakers have to embrace it and play with it. And this is, I think, happening quite well here in this country. Where do you see, and I'm not just talking about Ringier, I'm talking in general about companies in Switzerland, for example, what are the root causes for the lack of tech talents? Because everything goes digital, um, the demand is so high. Secondly, I think developers, engineers, data experts, um, they tend to, which is great, they tend to ask very, very precisely what is expecting me if I join company A, B or C. They want to have, um, they want to be embedded in a positive, dynamic, uh, meaningful, um, fast moving environment. It used to be that you would have five people applying for the job and then they, you know, and they, they, they pitch and you pick the one you like. Today, um, if you have one developer, it's probably five companies and he's pitching you. So it turned once. Product people have to realize that these tech people are not just the people sitting in the back of a room, you know, maybe wearing uh, more the sneaker style shoes. And if you have a problem, you call them, you know. Without them, again, in our business, your content is not worth anything anymore. So bridging basically tech to say it in a generic way and product is probably the biggest challenge we all have. Mm -hmm. By the way, we still talk way too much about business plans and Excel sheets. We should be talking more about the products of the future and mm -hmm. the user experience and what the people really you know, need when they are on their smartphone, take an example, and just want to have a three touch result on whatever the service will be. Mm -hmm. You seem very passionate about this this topic of digitization. Um, it seems that you're not just focusing on the financial results of, of your organization, but you have there's a deeper meaning of it to you. Could you, um, as a closing kind of statement, elaborate on what your motivation is, what drives you? Panic that we missed the train. For me, this is a game um, that has the name survive. 
media industry and we have seen lots of consolidation, lots of media companies have disappeared already or got merged into other companies. So it's literally to survive. Mm -hmm. On a second level, I think it's fundamentally exciting, thrilling um, how life is changing mm -hmm. for people, normal people, how you look for a train today, how you, if you want to go from A to B, how you find your way, um, how you pay with your smartphone, um, how you will be talking with the device that makes your life easier, um, how you consume news or entertainment, how you order your shoes. It's basically your whole life is changing and I think in many ways for the good. Makes your life easier, makes your life faster, makes your life more efficient, um, makes your life more dynamic. So this is kind of the second level. So the first one is just how we will survive. I'm very paranoia. Mm -hmm. I always am afraid we're just about to miss something. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to implement this paranoia into my company. Don't be relaxed, don't be laid back. Be always kind of ready to act, ready to learn, ready to improve. And the second thing is our lives are changing in a, I would say, just phenomenal way. Mm -hmm. It's been a fascinating conversation. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thanks. Thanks.